you know, now as they say in the ring, we've shaken hands, let's come out fighting. <laughs> On the Iran Contras issue, Congress did uh, pass a law forbidding um, military aid to the Contras, but your administration, or at least members of your administration, appear to have done their best to circumvent the law um, in one way or another. I wonder, isn't what's happened here at least a violation of the spirit of the law on aid to the Contras? No, I don't think so. Because while we didn't do anything uh, in the nature of uh, trying to continue ourselves uh, sending aid down there, uh, which would have been against the law. Uh, the, uh, since 1985, the Boland Amendment has uh, uh, permitted the, under the Secretary of State the approach to other countries to solicit help uh, for them. And there is nothing in that law that prevents citizens, uh, individuals, or groups uh, from offering aid of whatever kind they wanted uh, to them. I think that, if I could, you've, let me, if I try to set the record straight and maybe other answers won't take this long or not, I think there's been a great misperception that has been created, even resulting in the term of Iran-Contra affair. The two are two separate ideas. But one of the perceptions is that I have been concealing things, and now these hearings are bringing more and more out and going to express how much I know about the Contra situation. Well, for several years, I've gone public. I've made it very clear to everyone how I feel about the freedom fighters. Incidentally, I use that term instead of Contra because Contra was the appellation that was laid on the freedom fighters by the Sandinista government as a uh, term of derogation. And I have gone public. I have gone to the public and tried to get them to influence Congress to join us in, which they finally did, in helping the freedom fighters down there. Our goal is democracy in, uh, in that country, brought about by the people themselves. Now, this misperception let me just separate these two things. I've told you exactly how much I've gone public and will continue to do so for several years with regard to our need uh, to be of help to those who are seeking freedom and democracy in Nicaragua. The Iranian situation, there was nothing in that, uh, and uh, our engaging in that um, conversation that had anything to do with Central America. We received word through a third country that there were representatives from the Iranian government and body, I guess just the body of the citizenry, who wanted to establish covertly a contact with representatives from our country to discuss how we could have a better relationship. It was very evident that they were doing this without the Khomeini government's knowledge because uh, they probably, their lives would have been endangered if they were caught doing this. So there, the first misperception that has been created that somehow we were doing business with the Khomeini, not in any way. But we have been exploring every avenue we could for some time as to whether we could be of help in bringing out an end to that tragic war with Iraq, which has cost a million lives so far. So I immediately said, yes, let, it, let us get into that conversation and find out what they're proposing and what they want. Well, one of the first things that then came up was their request for something to, that they said would enhance their prestige, particularly with their own military, uh, if they could achieve it, but also to establish our, the credentials of our representatives, that they really represented the top of government in America. And they outlined that as a sale of weaponry, some tow missiles and some spare parts for their Hawk anti-aircraft missiles. My reply when that was relayed to me was, we have a hard and fast rule that we don't do business with governments 
that support terrorism. Well, they pointed out that they as individuals uh, were not supportive of terrorism. They gave some examples of things they as individuals had done uh, in that regard. And they made it plain they were talking about a relationship with our country that could take place in what they saw as a very probable new government in their country due to the ill health of the Khomeini. Well, they gave us that provision, and our reply was, well, wait a minute. Uh, we, we, we could suggest something that would uh, be very uh, great proof of your anti-terrorist position, and that is knowing that there's a philosophical relationship between the Hezbollah and Iran. They could start using their influence to see if they could get our hostages freed that are being held in, in uh, Lebanon by the Hezbollah. Now here again, this idea that we set out to engage in an exchange of arms for hostages is completely untrue. Hostages weren't even mentioned in this first relationship. They agreed that they would try to do this. And so the conversations went on. Now when a leak in a weekly paper in Beirut uh, turned all of America's press and the world press loose on what had been going on, in which we'd held covert with the idea of protecting the lives of the people we were dealing with, and suddenly it was out in the open, the, my first plea to the press here was, uh, please don't, don't even ask the questions. You can get some people killed and it could even include our, our hostages. Subsequently, the Attorney General, looking in to make sure what our position was and there hadn't been anything that uh, concealed in that, came into me one morning and said he had received word that there was a memorandum of some kind that indicated that there was more money than the $12 million we had received for our shipment of arms, and that some of that money had been deposited in a Swiss bank account that reports had it had been used for funneling money by others to the freedom fighters in Nicaragua. He said that he was going to dig deeper and see what he could learn. He came back to me later in the day and told me that, yes, this apparently had happened, that there was more money than the 12 million, some of it in that account. And we both agreed right then that before this gets exposed, as it might, that we expose it lest there be any charge that I was trying to conceal something. And the very next morning, we took this up with the joint leadership of the House and Senate, had them all in, told them exactly what we had learned, then went into the press room and told the, the White House press corps in there the same thing, and the Attorney General stayed for an additional hour answering their questions. Now, that was all the information we had, and the first time we had information that there was apparently more money received from the Iranians for our weapons than the cost of them. And as I say, we had received our 12 million. The deal was closed as far as we were concerned. Now, I've been waiting through all of these investigations that have been going on to find out where did that money come from, how did it get there, who was in charge of it, what did they do with it? Now, I'm answering your question a long way simply because it's an opportunity to correct these misconceptions that have been foisted off on the people and continue to be foisted off. And... Uh, By misconceptions, excuse me, Mr. President, do you mean that somehow you've had something to hide or that... That? Oh, well, every day, the press in these last few days even, and this with this joint committee, the first thing that I hear on the TV news is that, well, it's becoming plain that uh, I knew more and more about uh, uh, the Contra aid uh, than I had been, than I, I had, had told. 
Well, as I've just explained here, I don't have to know more about that. I know all about that. The only thing that I didn't know about and still don't have the full answer to is how did that figure with this honest effort that we made uh, to make contact or, or to respond to the contact that was made with us by these Iranian representatives and where that money came from. Yeah. Now, this is why I'm going to the trouble to tell you all this. Uh, no one's asked me about this. They've just assumed and made charges. And as I say, we weren't doing business with the, with the Khomeini. We weren't selling trading arms for hostages. We had made this arrangement to sell those weapons with the idea that here were some people who might have an influence we don't have and could free our hostages. That's a lot different than paying some kind of ransom in return for uh, to the kidnappers for our hostages. Well, in keeping with that response, Mr. President, I would assume that you still stand by the statement that you made that Oliver North is a national hero who was an agent in all of these transactions we're talking about. And my question is, if, if the judicial branch, if the courts should find that North is guilty of criminal acts of one sort or another, or any of his colleagues in this enterprise are so guilty, would you pardon them as national heroes, or would you expect them to uh, suffer the consequences of their I think deeds? That would, I think it is too early for anyone to uh, answer an if question of that kind. When I said to him, and talking to him and calling when he left the service, that uh, I still saw him as a national uh, hero, well, that was in response to the fact that he has medals for valor and for valorous deeds in, uh, in the in the uh, Vietnam War uh, that established that fact. Now, what, we're, what may be developed, you see, the, the thing is that I was not kept informed uh, as they went on in the negotiations with uh, what now seems to be uh, that it did just become then an effort uh, that one side wanted more arms than the $12 million worth that we'd sold them, and uh, that our people were trying uh, to arrange deals just for the exchange of hostages. Uh, this I was not informed of. Does that change your opinion of these people? Because they are now no. testifying in these hearings that they felt sincerely in their hearts that they were obeying your instructions. Well, uh, I have heard some of and read reports of uh, the testimony of Bud McFarland. And I think he has done more to clarify the whole situation and what's taken place uh, than has been done by all the hearings and investigations up till now. And uh, I have no quarrel with his honesty in what he has reported. Uh, I have a quarrel with the way, again, the interpretation that seems to be put on it by some in the media, uh, so that I think the people who watch the hearing will have a different impression than they, those people who don't watch the hearing but just get their reports through the evening news. One thing that Bud McFarland says was, was that during the most restrictive period of the Bolin Amendment, which was you know, October 84 to late 85, that he felt you had a more liberal interpretation of, of what the NSC, for instance, could and couldn't do. What was your feeling about, as you know, it only, um, the amendment only cited CIA and DOD and ag other agencies involved in intelligence activities. Yes. What was your understanding? Well, my interpretation was that then that was not restrictive on, on the uh, National Security Advisor or National Security Council uh, going strictly by that. Then there was a subsequent amendment or change in the amendment that further opened it up, the, the one that from back to 85 that uh, said that the Secretary of State could go out and solicit help. So um, he, was, he was testifying uh, accurately, and it was a, a disagreement. I believe that the NSC is not an intelligence operation, and it's simply an advisory to me, and there has nothing ever been in the Boland Amendment that could keep me from asking other people to help them. The only restriction on me was that I couldn't, uh, I couldn't approve uh, uh, the sending of uh, help or, or arms myself or, 
out of our budget money. Mr. President, can I switch topics a little bit? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I didn't know the first one was going to take so long. <laughs> Almost every one of your closest political advisors from your 1980 campaign uh, is now in one sort of trouble with the law or another, and uh, specifically Michael Deaver, uh, Ed Meese, your Attorney General, uh, Ray Donovan, who's on trial, as you know, up in New York, Lynn Nofziger. Each of them has one problem or another. Um, more than 50 officials in your administration over the past six years has been forced to leave government under the cloud of some one improbity or another, whether an illegality or an ethical problem. How do you account for this, sir? Well, I could start off by saying that I think there ought to be quite a review of some of the restrictions that have been put uh, on the appointment of individuals to government. Uh, there have been a number of people also that were willing to volunteer and give up at great sacrifice, give up handsome incomes and so forth to serve in government that have come to us before the appointment was finished and said, no, I'm sorry, I would like to have done it, willing to give up all of that. But I'm just not going to go through this hassle that is imposed on anyone that is willing to, to serve in government. So you feel the standards well, are too high. And then also, the thing now, the restrictions that have been put on individuals when they leave the government, uh, I think that these could stand review. Those restrictions don't apply to former congressmen and senators, but uh, only to people who've served in uh, appointed positions in government. And I would call to your attention, uh, well, first of all, with Ray Donovan, uh, this was a case of an indictment that was brought after he had been cleared through all of the process here uh, with regard to uh, the, uh, the contract business that he, he had, the construction business. Frankly, I have found him to be a man of great integrity. Uh, I am... I'm very interested in what might be the outcome of this, but the minute an indictment was brought, he, of course, resigned. You can't have a cabinet member who is under indictment. Now, on some of the others, I'd like to point out, Ed Meese, he is the one that has asked for a private investigator. And he doesn't appoint that private investigator. Uh, outside judges do. And he has asked for it uh, in order to, to clear his name. Uh, the same is true of Mike Deaver, even though he was out of government. He asked for the same thing. Uh, so I don't think that there's... Uh, here and there, there have been a couple of cases of someone that's something that was overlooked in all of the uh, FBI investigation and everything came up of something out of their past that uh, they considered uh, warranted their leaving government service. But uh, I'm going to tell you, I think that we have got as f fine a cabinet as has ever been appointed by any president. So just to follow up on that then, you're, you're saying that the standards themselves in many cases are unreasonable. And these people, there's no pattern of people doing anything intrinsically wrong. It's just that for one reason or another, the standards for government officials and when they leave office have become unfair or unreasonable. Well, on that, I think that there's it is so easy for something inadvertent uh, to happen. Uh, you know, you could almost interpret this that if a person was a doctor and left government service, uh, they could file charges against him if in less than a year he treated a patient <laughs> that was still a government official. Uh, it's, uh, that may sound ridiculous, but it seems to me that it's as, as bad as that. If I could broaden this the question a little bit. Uh, in recent months, we've had a series of questions about public ethics. We've had the um, people in public life or related to public life. Uh, we've also had the insider trading fewer on Wall Street. We've had Jim and Tammy Baker. We've had the Marines and the Embassy. We've had the Gary Hart situation. Is there something that's going wrong with public ethics or public morality? No, but I do think that there has grown up a kind of a cynicism on the part of the people because of some of these things. But I'd like to also point out that things of this kind have been going on for a long time, not only out in the other world, in the business world, but in government too. But isn't it maybe also an indication 
of our own purity that uh, we have been the ones that have been finding some of these things. It was just as when they were attacking the Secretary of Defense for uh, $600 toilet seats and so forth. Uh, it isn't that we were suddenly the ones that were doing these things. We were the ones that were finding out this is what, what had been going on for a long time. You mean specifically your administration? Yes. Finding these things. And uh, I'm kind of proud of that. You know, maybe I could just use a little anecdote. Everybody accuses me of this anyway. But I remember back when I was on the mashed potato circuit, when I was the president of the Screen Actors Guild. And you know in Hollywood, if you don't sing or dance, you wind up as an after-dinner speaker. So personal appearances of mine would be making speeches. And what would I talk about? I did my own speeches, and well, naturally, I went out and tried to correct what I thought were the misconceptions about Hollywood. The Hollywood had, didn't have public relations, it had uh, propaganda about it. And I, would, I had located such facts as that uh, the divorce rate among Hollywood people was lower than the national average. That the only problem was we had a few multiple marriage people that were uh, of such stature in show business that uh, they got a lot of attention whenever a divorce happened. Other things of that kind, uh, that the uh, church membership and attendance was tremendously high among the people of the motion picture industry. Well, I would make this kind of a speech when I was out there. And then one day, something happened. Another actor got in trouble for something or other. And a senator introduced a bill. And the bill was going to give Congress the right to license motion picture actors and actresses. And you couldn't be one unless you had a federal license. And I added that to my speech. With this line, I told that what he was going to, what he was advocating. And I said, I find it passing strange because there are three United States senators in prison at the moment and no actors. Is that, is that a warning uh, that uh, if we're having another moral crisis or there's talk of one today, that uh, you're, are you warning, in fact, not to try to legislate morality again? No, no. I am, I am for morality, you know, I'm <laughs> upholding of morality. In fact, I wish there was more of it taught in our schools. I think that the, and then this whole thing, the uh, desperation to make sure that we separate church and state in our places of education has led to value-free education, which means that teachers uh, don't teach what they're teaching with any idea of saying what is morally right or wrong. Well, I think that kids want adults to tell them what's morally right or wrong. So, uh, no, not that, but I was just pointing out that uh, this um, I have seen before evidence of this question that you just asked here, that suddenly are we somehow a, a den of thieves here? Well, no, we're not. And I think we've got a very high moral, moral limit. Mr. President, uh, you gave a speech recently on another question of values, uh, democratic values, saying you'd like to see elections tried in Nicaragua. Does that mean that you would com commit to abide by the results of such an election if the current regime were to win a uh, fairly supervised election and we would cease to support any resistance efforts against that government? Yes, we would have no quarrel then. But this is the thing that's wrong. This is a government that seized power by force. It was the only group in the revolution against Somoza that was an organization, the Sandinista organization, a communist organization. The other revolutionaries there, even those who were leaders and so forth, were just individuals that had joined in on this. And immediately that the revolution was over, taking advantage of the fact that they were organized, the Sandinistas took power. And they very quickly got rid of the other revolutionary leaders, either by execution or by uh, exile or just drove them out of any uh, position that they might have. And so, yes, from the very beginning, our goal has been democracy in Nicaragua brought about by the people. And I have to tell you that the, the uh, freedom fighters 
at one point when we were trying, and with the help of the church, trying to bring about this kind of a, a democratic solution, they agreed to lay down their weapons and to join in this kind of a, of a movement. It was the Sandinista government that refused to join in what had been proposed. They are not about to risk the power they've seized uh, by submitting it to a vote of the people. And, the uh, and I've never known any other government administration uh, in any other country that ever would either. But if we can bring about this thing to where and with just what you mentioned, with enough international supervision to ensure that the people are fairly treated, just as was done in El Salvador. And could I call to your attention that in the El Salvador situation, the opposition to our wanting to help the bringing about of democracy there was attacked as we're attacked today. And that time the people who were attacking us were in support of the guerrillas that are still fighting that democratic government after three elections have been held. And our communists supported and backed, and backed by the present Nicaraguan government. So uh, this is what we want, democracy. I just follow up and want to clarify one thing that yeah. you said, Mr. President. Um, you said that you didn't believe the Bolin Amendment applied to members of the NSC. So are you saying, in other words, that there was nothing to forbid, say, Oliver North or anyone else from working with or knowing about what Dick Secord was doing as long as the NSC itself wasn't directly involved? Is, in other words, was there nothing wrong with him helping Richard Secord and his group either raise money or arrange for arms to be delivered? Oh, I don't know how to answer that without legal counsel here <laughs> as to, uh, to what we can do. I, uh, if we're talking about uh, giving guidance to someone who wants to contribute and support the freedom fighters and telling them uh, what's the phone number <laughs> or the address and, and how to do it, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, to my knowledge, uh, uh, that is what the hearings and the independent counsel are sorting out. So yes, that's what they're sorting out. And to my knowledge, Nothing has been established yet as, as being illegal. Bringing people to the White House and having administration and officials appear before them and give them pep talks, that's fine. The people, that, the people that came to the White House were brought in here for me to thank because those people brought with them some television spot ads to show me that they had raised money to buy television ads to influence the Congress <laughs> to be supportive of our position. Well, that was a little unusual. But we have other groups that do that, that go out of their way to try and, and things like tax reform and everything else, to try to influence the Congress. They're getting plenty of lobbying of the other kind. And uh, so, yes, there were two meetings with groups, and that's what they were here for, and I thanked them. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Up and we have 15 or 20 more questions we didn't get to. Well, we certainly do. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe 30. <laughs> well, thank you very much for well, making the time for us. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. I have been able to bear my mind? soul so for several months. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Right. You bet. You're going to have a press conference soon? Mm -hmm. You're going to have a press conference soon? Uh, not That's what they're going to ask us when we get out of the yes. restroom again. So. <laughs> We're going to have our own steak out outside. <laughs> yeah, not, not a while, not while this, uh, while this, this hearing is going on. I, I don't think so. I think it just uh, kind of adds to the whole circus atmosphere. Oh, really? All the way through to the hearings? Huh? Well, well, I, I don't think it's into July. I haven't made a final decision as to how long, but I don't think right now the way things are that there'd be any, uh, any good done. Well, they'll be sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.